Today, we're very fortunate to have the departing mayor from Bar Calden Regional Council, Sean Dillon. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Aaron. Great to be with you and your listeners. Excellent. Thanks for uh, joining us today. We, uh, you're leaving your seat as mayor in Bar Calden, and I just want to reflect on the last eight years in local government for you and like what your aspirations are for the future, and probably just uh, a few questions about what, what uh, your time was like as, as a local government person. So yeah. I, I suppose um, but an easy way to start is what would be your favourite to- part of local government experience as a councillor or a mayor um, over the last eight years? What, what, what are you most proud of? Uh, there's so many different things depending on the context with which you view your, your, your own immediate history. And I guess I haven't actually thought about things in terms of legacy. I didn't pull it on. I was very young, um, not not super young, but I was quite young. You know, I was only 32 when I first um, decided to enter into the local government arena. And, and that you, at that stage, you're pretty – conceded or you've got a big ego if you're thinking about the legacy you want to leave. You're thinking more about the difference you can make, um, what's driving you to get involved, not about entering into some record-breaking run as a mayor or a councillor or, you know, an unbroken stretch of non-competed seats. That that That's not why you do it. So, to, I, and because I, I haven't yet got to the point where that's in the past, I probably haven't reflected it individually on so many things but I'm I'm really I guess the things that make you get out of bed every day answer the phone when you can tell it's a council call get in the car and drive to the office is when people at a local level bring you a problem and you and they trust you to find the solution and sometimes you have to be honest and say look that's going to be something outside of my ability to control the outcome but I can certainly push in your direction and and that can be everything from sealing a bitumen road to um or, or putting in some curb and channeling to get water away from the front of somebody's house or um, changing the opening hours of a library. Th- th- those things are all – they seem so minor when you, if you were to outlay each of your achievements. But for the people who asked for them, they're very significant. And, and even for you individually as an elected member, you think, uh, is, this, is the impact on me negligible? Is it a vote winner? No, and, and so people who think like that often turn down the opportunity to deliver real change, whereas I would take the ideas that people present to me on merit and uh, certainly not a yes man. If I thought that something wasn't in the best interests of the community or council, um, I'd politely point that out. Uh, but you, we live in a community that's so practically minded, that thinks so broadly as, as a, you know, as a, characterisation there is always those individuals that it might be a little bit parochial but broadly speaking the Bark Alden Regional Council area is filled with people who are so um, aware of the fact that there's more than just Munnaburra or Jericho or Barkey or Aramac or Alpha that, that everyone has needs and sometimes you have to choose when you've got limited funds or limited time or limited resources so I'm blessed to have had eight years representing uh a community that is actually so genuine in its approach to understanding everyone's needs are yeah. equal and some have to take priority over others. So uh, um, I guess it would be remiss of me not to point out that I'm in the last four years immensely proud of the rebuilding that we've done of the internal finances of council. Um, we were in a position that wasn't real healthy um, we're on a trajectory now to a very strong place. We're not quite there, but the structural fiscal reform that was required has largely um, now been undertaken and embedded and, and obviously can be undone, but um, it would be a foolish decision for a future council to do that, in my opinion. So to, to take us from where we only had a few months of staff pay in the bank to pretty comfortably um, able to guarantee project delivery uh, money in the bank for projects that may not have yet been thought of, saving for big concept ideas down the track that once again may not have been thought of, um, but also just ensuring that every day um, water, sewerage, waste, um, decent accessible roads, those sort of things are, are secured. So, yeah, I, I guess that's a long rambling answer, Aaron, but I, um, I'm i really sure that for individuals who I've been able to help, that the 
some of the things that I've done are quite minor in a broad context, but on a on a one to one basis, they're pretty important. Yeah, and I think that's important to understand. It's like the uh, I see local council um, as delivering those services that are vital, like your roads and and your sewerage and water and and that sort of thing, and making sure that the the financials are continuing on into the future in, in a good way. Um, what would you say if, if you were talking to someone who was thinking about um, going for a council uh, position uh, because we are entering that time where we're going into the elections, what would you give them uh, some direction about or, or suggestions to expect? The first thing I'd say if they're considering it is if you're elected, stay true to your own ideas. People elect you for who you are, who you're known to be. They know you out here. They, they, they have an understanding of or they all ask a friend. They're not electing you to be someone they want you to be. They're electing you for who you are. So take with you the skill set and stay true to that. That's really challenging though and, that, uh, and, uh, and it's a challenging thing that even I still have to challenge myself about every day. Um, the other thing I'd say to them at the outset is if you've had no local government experience, spend six months listening because there is substantially different approaches to running a small business to what there are to running a local government or running a large business for that matter. The, the fundamentals of a balance sheet still look exactly the same. The fundamentals of a profit and loss still look exactly the same. But the drivers that make key areas of things like revenue and assets our assets are worth hundreds of millions, but they're worthless. They've got no commercial resale value, you know, apart from a few town halls um, that, that, you know, could have a commercial. Th Most of our assets are roads um, or water and sewage assets, and then they're, they're worthless in real commercial terms as a business person. Um, but under the conventions that govern local governments, of course, they've got a real value in our, in our balance sheet. And, and that value is real. Um, you know, you do have to continue your asset renewal and your asset replacement program. And, and I'm talking heavily about the finances because it starts there. Everything you need to do to improve your community needs a strong financial basis to underpin it, whether it is changed opening hours in a library, more access to the pool, whether it's more bitumen road, whether it's um, increased green space within a town. Every single thing a local government does costs money, including its own meetings. Like we cost things that, Small business owners often don't, and that's their own time. Every officer of council has to account for where they spend their time in a day because their time sheets are costed to a specific area so we can drill down. Now, that's not always done well, um, but we've got better at it. Our council has certainly got better at shining a light on, on the areas that are and, – and just because an area costs money with low revenue doesn't mean you sack it, doesn't mean you say, no, we're not doing that. But you have to be aware of that that's a key – a key cost impediment on council with no real revenue. And that's the difference between us. We, we have a obligation um, to provide services that may not, I think there was one pool in the whole of Queensland two financial years ago that ran at a profit and that was a Chandler Aquatic Centre. You know, so no one runs pools because they're a financial winner for the local government or that they even break even. They, they don't, they just don't, they cost, millions of dollars to maintain, but they're an important part of livability in a community, of drowning prevention in a community, um, and of simply uh, surviving. You know, it's Western Queensland. It's 47 degrees on the day before Christmas. It, it, you need to have that opportunity to cool off. Um, so the other thing that I'd say is you hear all this talk a bit that local governments are so much more than roads, rates and rubbish, right? And, and certainly I heard that before I came in. And, and to a certain extent, they are required to be more than that, but they still are that. Don't ever drop the ball on the fundamentals that need. So roads are important for our communities because they're the connectivity. Um, rates are the only thing that we get from a community in terms of recovering. So you have to make sure that the rates are set high enough that they offset a component of your, um, uh, your, your profit and loss, but they're not that high that they scare people away from investing in your community or that you place too big an impost on low revenue earning or low income earning people. And rubbish, water and sewerage are the building blocks. You need clean, safe, reliable drinking water. We, need, we don't want to live in a third world country in Africa. We need rubbish off the streets. Where you have sewerage in a community, which three of our five communities do, that's important that that flows for obvious reasons without using any of the puns. So. Um, 
I've got no problem with dreaming and with dreamers, but never lose sight of the fundamental responsibilities. That's the finances and those key service deliveries that make our community safe and keep ticking. Yeah. It's, uh, you're right. These are very important um, parts of being a, uh, a council and making sure that livability is there so you can attract people to the region and, and visitors and stuff. Um, and on that note, I did want to ask you some questions about the rec park um, mm. because for the region and, and for Bark Holden, that was very controversial um, and it, it really split the community in two. Uh, you had the, the people that were for it or the people that were basically against it. Um, there, there was some nuance to that because some people were for it but maybe not where it was placed or, or, or that sort of thing. So um, it, it wasn't a, a black and white issue. Um, but it did come down um, to the the council. Do you feel like council did enough due diligence in the lead up to that and the development application um, specifically around like the flooding issues that, that were there? No. And what would you have done different, I suppose, um, oh, a given, given the opportunity? Yeah, a proper planning process. Now I've got to put my hand up. I was I was on council when that happened and and – certainly probably should have asked harder questions and I was probably renowned for the hard question asking as it was anyway. Uh, uh, we, it was a sign of placing too much faith, both as a member of the community but also as an elected member that's not the mayor. It was certainly a case of placing too much faith in the advice of a senior officer and, and, the, and the mayor rather than undertaking your own. And it was written in the report. The, the, the planning, our planners, council's own planners recommended against approving the rec park until two issues were resolved. Um, now, that advice was ignored, um, a mistake I never made again. Um, read your report more thoroughly. Interrogate the reasons to why. that Our planners are some of the best, if not the best, contract planners in the state. Um, the work they do is incredible. They clearly identified two points, both of which became very significant pain points. There's no water licence and the flood report. Oh, sorry, flood and noise reports weren't done, which was lumped as one reason. So we invested millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars against the planner's advice, not because the planner said it was a bad thing, not because it said it shouldn't proceed where it was, just simply that we needed to undertake the necessary steps that were required in the process. Now, the rectification of that luckily wasn't too substantial in terms of dollars. It was still dead money. But, oh, the pain for our community, for residents that were caught in that uh, flood zone. And I met a number of times with a number of them and it was real. The impact on their life, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that they were against the park or, or we're using it for political grandstanding. Remember, this is in the first year, the first few months of a new term, so too far out for that type of attitude or um, activity. These were people whose – their own home, not an investment property, not a car shed or an outhouse, their own – their physical dwelling was potentially being impacted. Now, there were some around who said, oh, it's only minor, it's this and it's that, and it could flood in a big flood anyway. That doesn't matter. Council – knowingly, and I, as I said in the previous council, as a councillor, was part of the decision, uh, knowingly made a decision that could have placed them in jeopardy. And, and, and it'd be my biggest regret, um, not building the rec park, but just not doing it properly. And I mean, it took months after the new council was sworn in to even secure the water licence as it was. And, and so it's ironic that it was probably my biggest regret in the way that process unfolded and my part in it, but it's also probably where there'll be some that would say that would be one of my biggest successes is putting the Premier on the bank of the rec park and saying it'll cost you, you know, it cost you a million and a bit to build this and it'll cost me 60000 to flatten it, you know, and and um, lo and behold, we had water a few weeks later. But um, and, and that was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it was actually deadly serious. We, we couldn't have – we had no water. They, they weren't letting us use water. Um, they, the, the department was being quite particular about seasonal allocations. Um, and so – all of these things should have been worked through. And, I mean, it cost council simply because we didn't have water. It cost us another $667,000 in, in a local grant, um, local government grant and subsidy scheme funding that just shouldn't. It, it, look, the process was badly handled at every level by everyone involved other than the planners. 
yeah, it, it was uh, very significant for the community. And I, I suppose for that, do you think it's fair some people in, in outlying communities from Bark Alden, um, they're annoyed that their rate paying money is going to that rec park and that, and that rectification and, and all that um, sort of thing. Do you think it's fair for all rate payers across the region to pay it? Do you, and do you think there's a way to recover costs on the rec park to soften that blow for, for those outlying communities? Uh, the rectification costs were, were pretty, I mean, they were there, but they were inconsequential really to, to the new build. Um, I, I live in one of those outlying communities a long way from, from the centre of the, of, of the council area and the feedback I consistently get that outweighs the negative is that the park is a fantastic addition to the council area. There are people from in and around Alpha that travel west to go water skiing now and undertake water-based activities that used to go to either Emerald or Clermont. So we're attracting and retaining local domestic tourism within the council area. The businesses of Bar Calden don't all benefit. Um, there was, you know, there's the constant argy-bargy about who benefits. Um, there's obviously the local business that that is operating out of the rec park um, that obviously benefits quite well. But there's varying days where those people will get fuel for their boat, fuel for their car, ice creams at the servo, might get a loaf of bread, might grab something from the IGA, um, might grab a beer on the way out of town or, you know, so uh, there is there is benefit to the community of Bark Alden, but where they've come from is the same. So, uh, th look, we have cost overruns on every project. Um, uh, a former Transport and Main Roads Minister in Queensland said, you just expect that. I don't. I, I think it's a disgusting position to take that you expect to overrun on every capital works project. Um, but some of those can be Mudabara Town streets, you know, poor planning, poor like the previous council just once again wasted more money than we wasted on the rec park, stuffing up the streets of Mutterborough, to be fair. Um, that cost was borne by all rate payers, you know. Um, so it's it's kind of you can't segment and say, well, we're just going to jack the rates up in Mutterborough to make Mutterborough pay for council's mistakes in Mutterborough. We've got to put a hand up and say that was a total um, – it was badly managed. The councillors involved at the time did a poor job of, of, of managing um, locally – community expectations, absolutely nobody that lives in Mudabara likes what happened to their streets. The money that we wasted in um, – and we were hit by wet weather, which you can't control, um, but then designs changed and the whole thing was uh, – yeah, but anyway, I, I won't accept responsibility for that one. That was a, That's an operational thing that was just handled badly. That's, uh, that's fair. I think um, the, the rec park was something that was very uh, unique in your time on local council um, and something else that sort of – I think shaped you and and the way that you handle yourself uh, from what I saw within council meetings is uh, when you were called out by Queensland Health and investigated for some comments that uh, you made on behalf of the community. What do you think the landscape is nowadays of um, a community leader being able to speak up and and talk on behalf of a community without that uh, getting in trouble? I suppose. Ah, oh, look. The state government undertook a review, to their credit, um, of the OIA and there have been some reforms. The only way to reform the OIA is to get rid of it. Um, it, is a, it is a curse, it is a blight on the right of elected members to speak on behalf of their community. If a councillor does something that's misconduct, the local council should deal with that and if not, the people of the ballot box will every four years. Um, if they've undertaken corrupt activity, put it to the triple C, which is where it goes now anyway. Um, the OAA is costing Queenslanders the pra the very reason that it exists, and the sorry the very the very fact that it exists is costing dozens of good people, communities dozens of good people as uh, elected members. It is it is a joke. Um, it was badly run by an incompetent administrator for a very long time. Um, a political activist with no political base. It wasn't the Labor Party. It wasn't the Queensland government pursuing this witch hunt. Um, it, it, it simply, no other level of government is held to account to the same degree as local government in Queensland other than on corrupt activities. Of course, we should be holding people to account for corrupt. If you want to have an opinion, you should be entitled to that. And, and I was clearly expressing an opinion at the time and, you know, whoever it was that complained, you know, they, this is the problem. We've got a bit of a precious society. But th to think that they could vaccinate one community um, – I was, I was really 
in, in a day, you know. We, we, we were at the height of the pandemic and we wanted to make sure that our communities were well looked after. I got a good relationship with a lot of people at Queensland Health. They weren't overly impressed that I was disappointed, but I live in a community where there's no doctor on a regular routine basis or certainly wasn't at the time that's improved since. So, um, yeah, the, the culture around community leaders speaking up isn't great. Hence why I think you're probably seeing a record number of mayors not recontest this election. Could be a record for all time, certainly since amalgamation. Um, and it, it, even if the OAA is reformed or abolished, which is the only way to reform it properly, um, the, there's, there's the people out there on social media, the nameless, faceless people that still – fake outrage at something someone says. I've used my interviews with the media, I've used my conversations with people um, not to curry favour but to have a communication with a number of people at one time. Um, I've never turned down a request for an interview. Um, I've, I've always shared whatever knowledge I can of an idea, of my opinion. I've differentiated between my personal opinion and counsel. Um, we, we should be having honest and forthright conversations without necessarily the vitriol that comes or, oh, he complained about me, I'm going to put him into the OIA. Like, they're school kid rubbish and we wonder why our school kids are in, you know, the state that they are around social media. So, I, I honestly, you have to have a thick skin and it's not the same in reverse. People get so sensitive about an alternative to what they think's right and then they use that as a complaint mechanism um, and beat their chest about it. Honestly, we I'm proud of the level of debate. Sometimes they stretch the boundaries a little bit in my boardroom. Um, I've never silenced a counsellor. Um, they every we, we at times we go on a little bit too long. Um, but my councillors are elected by the same people that elect me, and their voices are entitled to be heard. And and I don't care whether um, they're being watched on a video recording a few weeks later or being watched by a gallery. Um, it's not about um, accountability, which which is an important part of it, but it's about honesty and transparency. And people are entitled to know, but the people that have that opinion, that are elected to that opinion, have that opinion, they're entitled to the respect of the community to go, I, I disagree with you, but thanks for at least telling me where you stand. Yeah, it is hard to really walk that line of speaking your mind, having an opinion, um, but then I suppose uh, not facing repercussions because it is an opinion. Um, What's your opinion on the, the biggest risk to the Barcaldon Regional Council region uh, as, as we go forward in, into the future? What can you see coming up in the future or maybe positives that you can see? Oh, I'll, start with the, I'll start with the glass half full. I, I think um, if we can't arrest the population decline, which is, you know, I think it has been um, still talked about, but I think, you know, talking about population decline, we can't find me a house. Can't do it. So I'm not sure that it's quite as bad as, and, you know, there's a lot of issues around the way that the, the census is conducted in Australia. And um, so anyway, if I leave all of that, that's a bit hard to get into that. Um, but the withdrawal of government services, so withdrawal of medical practitioners, withdrawal of teachers, withdrawal of, of um, police officers, um, transport and main road staff, um, Queensland Rail staff, Ergon, you know, I know people say Queensland Rail and Ergon, but, I mean, they're, they're government employees just through a different – line um if we were to see those essential services that would then just flatline um any chance of growth um people would see it as too high risk it'd be that internal sovereign risk um so we, we do need to continue to pursue um, potential economic development there's a number of ways that that could be it could be linked to agriculture it could be linked to resource extraction it could be linked to um, new and exciting renewable energy opportunities um, but we need to make sure that the base that's here now, where we've got to, we've already shrunk immeasurably, you know, in all of those areas that I've just said, um, we need to make sure that this is our low watermark, that, that, the, that we, we maintain and protect what we've got um, to ensure that, that, that any um, impact from unforeseen circumstances doesn't draw that down. We've got to say, this is the bottom of the road, she's up from here. I think the opportunities are so strong moving forward in that, uh, unfortunately, we're probably a one-trick pony community in that agriculture is the key revenue driver within the region, within um, commerce within the region. Obviously, there's tourism and 
and things. But, you know, even the um, retail outlets in our communities are driven by um, people linked to agriculture. So I think you take agriculture out of communities, you've got nothing. Uh, even our tourism is, to a large extent, agriculturally based, you know, farm stays and so forth. Uh, so agriculture is at a precipice, I think, where especially in Western Queensland-based agriculture of where it's, it is really green. You know, there is a growing number of high-value organic producers in Western Queensland. As the world becomes very aware of what it eats, where it comes from, the method of production, um, we stand in our unique environment very well protected. It may not rain here very much, but that also lowers the pests, the weeds, the needs for things like herbicides. And uh, so I, 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 we, we are in a very unique position to see a revaluation and a recapitalisation of agriculture driven by what our local competitive advantage provides us over areas that are already very um, heavily taxed with things like a lot of irrigation already. Um, so, you know, very intense agricultural production, whether it's livestock or, um, you know, various broadacre cropping. So I, I see us in a good position to value add and grow our communities, provide future opportunities um, that's not all that removed from where we are already now, but but will provide, um, as I said, a recapitalisation of that local industry moving forward. Um, certainly very much open arms to a lot of new opportunities that don't take away from that. Um, but I would hate to see, like, if we were to see broad acres of Western Queensland locked up for, say, national parks, flatline, go. You've only got to see all carbon farming. Go and have a look in the southwest and see what carbon farming's done to communities where there's no one left. The money, they're not owned by locals. There's no one managing them. It's a, it's a real problem. So we, we need to keep going with what we've got and, and provide that opportunity for new industries to prosper. Um, so... Th that's the, the future of the region. And I suppose uh, my last question is uh, the future of Sean Dillon. Uh, now that you're stepping down as mayor, uh, are you going to stay in politics? Um, are you, are you going to stay invested in, in our region? Are you just going to go back to the country and live a, a full life now that you've uh, contributed to your community? <laughs> I, I live a full life doing? every day, Aaron. <laughs> I live a full life. Don't worry about that. Uh, there's... Um, there's several thousand cows and, and a few family members that would be pretty keen. Look, I um, uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time in local government. Uh, it has provided me an opportunity to uh, represent my community but also to work for my community and those two things are very distinctly different. Uh, I, I am definitely very keen to um, at some point pursue um, further opportunities in, in representative politics in, in the state arena. Um, I've seen that the, 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 the working dynamic between local and state governments, obviously local governments owned by state government, um, that, that, that ability for state government to hold all of the cards really from, from a local perspective. So certainly, uh, yeah, there's, there's, I'm very keen to continue working in this space to work for the best interests of, of our community. Uh, I, that doesn't happen. Um, yes, I've got very bus substantial business opportunities within the region, but, yeah, I'm, I'm heavily invested in this region. I've got grandparents that have come from north of Aramac to fourth, fifth generation uh, in and around Alpha. So uh, there's no part of the Bark Alden Regional Council area that's not special to me and, and I in certainly intend to make home for a very long time to come. Right on. Thank you very much. That's uh, all my questions and thanks for taking the time out to have you on and tell us about your last eight years. Thanks, Aaron. Thank thanks. you.